Good morning. Um, really sorry that I can't be in class today because I my son threw up this morning and I can't send him to school who after throwing up. So I was going to record just a little bit of what's going on or just a little quick idea of what's in class today. Um, first of all, I wanted to play this quick little video of you. This is my old dog. Her name was Nala. Nala was a black lab, which she still is technically, but she passed away about five, six, seven years ago, maybe? Not sure. Anyway, um, here she is sitting here watching me eat a peanut butter sandwich. Um, the fun thing about her watching me eat a peanut butter sandwich is that you can see what she's thinking. So we watch here for a second and something happens and she changes her behavior and then she goes back to normal. We watch again, wait for it, wait for it. Oh. Almost there. Oh, there it is again. So what she's doing is she's reacting to some stimulus in the environment. So let's describe how this works. Make sure that the camera is still recording. Is it still? Yep, it's still recording. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so we'll go back to here. Minimize that. Okay, so if you can see over the shoulder, my shoulder here, the dog, Nani, say hi. That's Nani. Okay, so let's go and I'm going to show you what's happening with this video. Okay, so in behaviorism, we don't really care about what the dog's thinking. We care about the, the behavior. We don't care about the mind. We don't care about anything else. So I'm going to write a formula for you. It's really simple. Beha behavior, this is a mathematical term followed by a stimulus a reinforcement minus a stimulus that's a punishment results in a change in behavior probability. So I'll write this up in a little bit more detail here. So let me go to the size of the pen, which I thought I could adjust. Let me try this one. So this is a behavior. Okay, and a behavior is measured by, it's a little smaller, so it works. A behavior is defined by its measurement. So we can measure the behavior of this dog. Um, the dog's behavior is staring, okay? And so the dog's staring behavior is focused on, well, me. And there's other ears, so we can look at her eye contact in time. We can also measure her ear position. We can also measure her head position. Okay, so those are the those are three basic measurements we can see in the dog. What she's actually thinking, we don't really know, but we do know that there is a stimulus that is affecting the behavioral probability of these three things. For example, there's a reinforcement. Reinforcement is anything, any stimulus, which we'll talk about in a few minutes that increases, sorry, fix that. Okay, increases. Behavior probability. So any stimulus, any stimulus that increases behavior probability is called a reinforcing stimulus. So what is a stimulus? Well, it is something, I'll throw this over here, something in your um wealth that is perceived. Okay, so this is pretty simple. Um, anything that's in our umwelt that is perceived is considered a stimulus. So what is, remember what the word umwelt means, that's the, the nature of your sensation and perception. So I'm gonna save this little picture here. 
Let's save it. Hit sketch four. All right. And so now let's go back and watch some more of this. Here she is. We can see when the stimulus is present. Watch as so you can see a change in her behavior. Watch her eyes. Watch her ears. Stimulus present. Yep, definitely stimulus present. Oh, stimulus going away. Stimulus not present. Eye contact disappears. Head movement disappears. Well, changes. And upright. Oh, stimulus present again. You can see a change. Whenever the stimulus is present, you can see a change in the dog's behavior. So you notice the intensity of the dog's behavior is changing. So something is changing about the stimulus as well. Oh boy, that looks great. I really want whatever that is. Nani's not impressed by watching the video. Wait for it. Some stimulus is drawing her attention away from what I'm doing, but oh boy, now it's getting really, really serious. High intensity behavior. There it is. That's good. Okay, so in this particular case, the stimulus is last bite of PB sandwich. So the last bite of the, I always give the dog the last bite of my sandwich. So as the sandwich is getting smaller, the stimulus is getting closer and closer to being ideal. So before, when I first start eating the sandwich, she sits down, but the behaviors are relatively subtle because the stimulus isn't very strong. But then there's a distribution, which we've seen lots and lots of times, is that the ideal situation, the ideal stimulus is last bite. When the sandwich is big, less behavior, less stimulus, which produces less change in behavior. After I've eaten the sandwich, you'll see in a few minutes, you'll see that there's also less stimulation and behavior changes pretty quickly. So as we get closer and closer to the last bite, she gets more and more excited. But as, as I finish the sandwich, her excitement decreases. As I'm slowly finishing the sandwich, her excitement decreases. This is called a generalization gradient. So if I go back to my behaviorism formula, behavior followed by a stimulus as a reinforcement minus a stimulus as a punishment results in a change in behavior, probability. And so the behavior in response to the stimulus as a reinforcement, when the sandwich is the last bite, it has the greatest effect on the change in behavior when it gets close to the last bite. Before, it doesn't have a great effect on behavior because the, the effect is based on the relationship between the behavior and the stimulus. It's actually, it's super simple when you actually think about it, that whenever there's a behavior that's occurring, a stimulus will produce a change in behavior. Now some behavior, some stimuli, which we'll put in red, are punishment. And that also has an effect on behavior, but except the punishment has a inverse effect on behavior. So a punishment would be lowering behavior probability. So because it's something as stimulus as a punishment, it lowers, it decreases behavioral probability. So if I were to not feed her my sandwich, she would not be reinforced. If I were to yell at her for begging, that would be a punishment. And so you, the interaction of the two change the actual probability of the dogs and behavior. They interact with each other. So let me save this one again. Sketch five. Okay, so I'll post these up on the, on the canvas as well. But when we look at 
when we look at this behavioral formula, the behavioral formula applies to all different situations. So I can show you a different situation here. Let me go back to my photos. This is another one which I really like. Not sure if the sound, yep, the sound is on. Okay, so this one is pretty cool. Every night at uh, 6.30, the dog and I go for a walk. Now, my little dog and then I do the same thing. So it's, I guess it's my behavior that's training the dogs. But so let me put the, put the formula up and then we can see what's going on. So a behavior, which is going for a walk, a stimulus that's reinforcing, a stimulus that's punishing, change in behavioral probability. Okay, so we'll just put this back a bit. So the reinforcement for going for a walk is 6.30. What the other, I was gonna say, what is the other reinforcement for going for a walk? And I'll sit and wait for you to answer. But 6.30 is the stimulus that signals that she gets to go for a walk. But also she gets to go sniff, she gets to poo, um, she gets to go outside, and she gets a dinner when she gets home. So this whole going for a walk has lots of stimuli associated with it. This is why it's such a strong behavior. The punishment is, well, if it's not 6.30, she doesn't get to go for her walk. Um, or if I'm busy or I'm sick, I don't get to go for a walk. And that's a punishing. So she really wants to go for a walk. And I say that because, well, watch the video. Gotta figure out how to save those. Oh, <laughs> let's watch that again. Now, something just happened right there. What happened was, if you listen carefully, you can actually see it. I'm going to put that one on there. Something happened. A stimulus that was not intended was there. The stimulus was a ding, dong, the doorbell. Because the doorbell went off, all of a sudden the dog bark and run to the door. What's interesting is that this stimulus has nothing to do with going for a walk. This is stimulus is something that's superfluous. It's in her environment. This is something that has been classically conditioned. A classically conditioned stimulus is a stimulus that gets meaning through association. And the association, well, it's pretty simple. Stranger with something that in her own belt, in her natural behavioral reflexes, causes barking. And a doorbell, a doorbell is not in her natural own belt, but the doorbell is associated with strangers. So the doorbell has learned to become a part of her umbel. So the doorbell is now means parking. Okay, so if I change colors, we can label this a little bit more effectively. So the stranger is an unconditioned stimulus. In other words, it's a stimulus that hasn't been trained. It's a natural inner umbel. And barking is an unconditioned response. It's a natural reflex for Labradors, especially, to bark for no good reason. Uh, I've got a couple videos I'll show you in a few minutes of her barking for no good reason. The doorbell, however, is the doorbell is something that is not in her natural home belt. It has been conditioned. Conditioned stimulus, a change in her home belt, which causes a conditioned response. She never really barked at the doorbell before we moved into this house because our old house didn't have a doorbell. Um, well, I can show you a picture of that in just a second. Let me go back to here. I can show you a picture of that. Wink. 
And let's see, there's a video along here somewhere. Oh, here's her barking at a hole in the ground. Yeah, she's barking at a hole in the ground. And here's her barking at the front door of her old house. No doorbell, remember. Yeah, Anya got that. Um, and so with those particular, those particular examples, we'll go back to, um, oh, this is a good one. <laughs> this is the reason we have a lab, is that the lab is good with the kid. Um, so we go back and put this up here. In this particular case, and, and so any sign, any kind of barking is it is in a natural umwelt for the dog's behavior. It's a natural contingency. I'm gonna write this word up here. Contingency is the relationship between stimulus and behavior relationship between the stimulus and behavior. So we always describe behavioral contingencies as a relationship between the stimulus and behavior. So let me write this, let me write the formula back up here again. Behavior followed by a stimulus that's a reinforcement minus a stimulus that's a punishment results a change in behavioral probability. Now this particular video is pretty funny because my daughter's about one years old, about one and a half actually, and She's using the dog as a cushion. The dog is very upset by this, but she won't do anything to the kid because she's learned in her umbelt, the contingency is that she's not mean to the children. She never was mean to any of the kids. Um, she never mean to anybody because she's Labrador and they were bred to be friendly. So in her umbelt, the contingency is she's nice to people. Um, even though the kid's probably hurting her a bit, she doesn't seem to care because she, it's not in her nature to chomp. Um, our little white fluffy dog here, however, that's sitting over my shoulder right now, is in her nature to chomp. She doesn't like to be harassed and bugged, and so she'll chomp on people that, like my daughter, who <laughs> get in her face. Um, in fact, I actually have, oops, I actually have a video of that. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Windows settings. Sorry, it makes excellent video. I'm not sure what you're doing, computer. Sometimes this happens, it gets weird. video somewhere in here of a dog getting mad at my neighbor. And I had it up here before, but then I just closed it by accident. So it's fishing. It's the brain scanner. My son's flying a kite. Totally not worth it at this point, but we're going to play it anyway. There it is. This is typical naughty behavior. Especially when they were in the <laughs> Notice sharing the teeth. <laughs> okay, and so that particular behavior is very simple. This is a contingency. Strange boy, is that what he's going to strange boy? This is Miles, he's my neighbor, and the dog sees Miles as no good. And so she's baring her teeth and producing reflexive behavior saying, 
go away. We have this trained actually the white fluffy dog keeps boys away from um, keeps boys away from the house. Anyway, um, but this it's interesting how some stimulus produce she's never growled or never brushed at me. She usually will sleep on my shoulder. So for I I am a reinforcing contingency. I am a stimulus that has a reinforcement contingency. Miles is a stimulus that has a punishment contingency associated with it. These contingencies are associated with changes in behavior. So Miles signals threat, I signal reinforcement. Um, even if I mess with her, no, no, mess, 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 mess. She really doesn't seem to care. And you know, really just struggle through her day. <laughs> that's her. That's her entire life. The fact that I'm home is a big problem. Okay, so the the basic elements of trying to understand behaviorism. It's two basic things. Um, let me pull up one of the quick dog videos again, real quick. Let's pull up this one. I think I'm right on this one. Oh yeah. So the basic elements of the dog videos are really simple, okay? There is a behavior. In this particular case, what do we see? We see drool. Okay, so the, you know, is drooling is not a choice behavior, but it's a reflex. Therefore, so the stimulus that's causing the drool Okay, so the stimulus that's causing the drool would possibly uh, black purple be good. Okay. The stimulus that's causing the drool is food. Food causes drool. Unconditioned stimulus. However, um, there is no food. She's not eating. But breakfast. I just got home from mountain biking, so we're about to eat breakfast. Breakfast is associated with food. There's no food yet, but it's a dog waiting for food. Well, yes, because what do you see? Dog spit. Saliva. Okay, so the food produces the reflex of drool. Unconditioned response. Response behavior. Okay, breakfast is a conditioned stimulus. But when we sit down to eat breakfast, the dog drools because we always give her the last bite. Conditioned response. Her drool is not in response to actual food. Her drool is in a response to us sitting down to eat food. It's a preparatory response. So she's already being reinforced before we actually give her any food. It's kind of cool. So the behavior is drooling. Okay, The stimulus in this particular case is us sitting down to breakfast. Us sitting down to breakfast, even though she doesn't have any food, she's still starting to drool because she's learned over time through associations that food equals drool. Super simple. Um, I'll try to record a couple of videos of our little dog because she's really skittish. You can see she's really stressed out right now. Yeah, um, she's real skittish in the kitchen. Oops, sorry. Um, and whenever I drop something in the kitchen, she runs away. So she has a problem that there's a stimulus that she wants. Food is the reinforcement for being in the kitchen, but she's afraid of things falling on her. So she has this conflict. This conflict results in a change in behavioral probability. Super easy because the super behavioral probability is the change in behavior. She, depending on the amount of fear or depending amount of food, it changes the way she acts at a particular time. Now, this whole thing is called the law of effect. This was came up with by Edwin Thorndike. Edwin Thorndike figured out that this, whatever this dog is thinking, whatever this dog is thinking is irrelevant. It's what the dog is doing Whatever the dog is doing, the behavior of the dog is more important than what the dog is thinking. 
and by analyzing the behaviors, by looking at the effect of the stimulus reinforcement minus the stimulus of the punishment, you can then figure out why the dog is behaving the way it is. You can figure out why the dog, why is the dog behaving? A lot of you wanted to know why people do things. Well, this is how you figure it out because a behavior is a function of the stimulus, the stimuli in its environment. Here's the big problem with the law of effect. Law of effect is basically works, but you have to know all stimuli in an organism umbelt. Here's the problem. Umbelt, umbelt, umbelt. Sound the same in my head. Um, I'll kind of make it messy so you can't tell which one I meant. So an organization, or an organism's umbelt. In other words, what is in a, an, a critter's world? And so the way to write this is nature to be commanded must be, oops, obeyed. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. This is a statement that means that in order for you to change an organism, to change an animal, to train anybody, you have to first understand the organism's umbelt. You have to understand the nature of the organism. What is in their sensation and perception? The problem with people is the very concept of learning is also in our umbelt, or the process that we understand the world is also in our umbelt. So it's really complicated to try to figure out exactly what the human umbelt is relative to everything else. It's a real pain in the butt. Um, so I want to show you a quick little, another video clip here. Save that one. Okay. And there's another little video of the show about our umbelt. Um, where is it? Babies being born, you probably don't want to watch those. Okay, so this is something that's in our human umbrella. Okay, um, and this is pretty cool. Wait for it. Not sure if this is copyrighted or not. In other words, the lady's playing with the doll the way you should play with that doll. Now, now, there's no call for this kind of saucy behavior, lady. Okay, so going back. I would say 90% of boys will hit the doll. Just because of the nature and acceptance of little boys hitting the doll. What's really interesting about this though experiment is that when you, in humans, one of the things that we have in our own belt that a lot of animals don't is something called a concept. Which we'll talk a lot more about after, the, after our first test. Um, which is tomorrow. Um, but the concept is that you learn the rules for behavior 
not stimuli. So this is really complicated. So humans have the ability to learn concepts, rules for behavior, not reacting just to stimuli. So stimuli are much more, I'm going to draw this again, which I drew before, but we said before, stimuli are generalized and conceptualized. So that any a particular stimuli, so if the dog generalizes the, the begging stimuli, anytime I'm eating or anytime I'm having any snacks, the dog will then assume that those snacks mean, oh, it gets the last bite. Um, and therefore, any time I'm eating or munching on something, the dog gets the last bite. In a particular case of our little black lab, she would beg for anything, even if you're eating an orange, it didn't matter. She generalized, she conceptualized the idea that if we're eating, she wants to eat it. Um, she would even eat an orange slice, even though dogs generally don't like oranges. Um, she would eat it because we were eating it. Um, because she learned the concept of begging, not just, I want the peanut butter sandwich. She would beg from everything. So we can see if these kids generalize the concept because we can reinforce the concept as a behavior. And this goes against a lot of the principles of behaviorism, but a concept that is reinforced, stimulus is reinforcing, minus the stimulus is punishing, results in a change in behavioral probability. And so by, by encouraging the little child to hit the doll, they tend to hit the doll. If you encourage a child not to hit the doll, they generally won't hit the doll based on how they, res how they respond to the stimulus and punishment of the model. Um, okay, so watch. Good job, Dave. He actually even looks bored with it. past being bored with it. So, so why okay so this is a really interesting wait for it come on pen you can do it there we go so the aggression Your song in my head. Okay, um, aggressive behavior is a concept. So he did some specific aggressive acts, but he took the concept of aggression and was able to model the aggression. The aggression was reinforced, and that we see this with the with the guns. So with the gun, the, even though the model never played with the guns, if they saw the aggressive model, they increased the probability of playing with guns. Now the fun part is, is that most boys will play with guns. Um, they just, for some reason, aggressive toys are very fun for, for young boys. Um, a lot of chimpanzees will fight with each other and throw rocks at each other just for fun because testosterone causes aggression, sorry. But in order to test this if it's true, we can test it with little girls. So the little girl should not play with the bubble doll. <laughs> Talking smack. What's interesting is they don't say it, but the little girl had to be prompted to hit the doll. And once the little girl was prompted to hit the doll, she became much better at it than the boys. Go for it. Again, playing aggressively, without bounds. The model never did any of this stuff, but the little girl is figuring it out pretty quickly. In fact, she becomes a cold-blooded killer. OK. 
Okay, so when they say novel forms of aggression, what they're really showing is that is the concept, and I'm writing it three times, I know, the concept of aggression that the kids learn. And there's a couple of videos that we're going to show you after the break about that we break into cognitive psychology where really we do focus on the concept formation. Um, in fact, I'll send a little links out to these, um, the babies looking at different, um, different things to see the different uh, sides that the babies think about in the world. Um, the concept of aggression is the important part, not the actual aggressive act. In the control groups, the experimental group, the control groups who didn't see the aggressive model, they didn't come up with new fancy ways to hit the doll. They just hit the doll the way you're supposed to, just kind of punch it and get forward with it and walk away. Um, so this is really this is really fascinating because it's it's the same basic thing. Sorry for the video zigzagging all over the place. I'm just trying to write on the tablet. Behavior followed by a stimulus that's a reinforcement minus a stimulus that's a punishment produces a change in behavioral probability. If you follow this rule and you understand the umwelt, I think it is a T, the umwelt, then you can understand what the stimuli in the environment is. But in order to under understand the stimuli in the environment, you have to look at the person's learning history. This is something that's really important, looking at the person's learning history. There's something called latent inhibition. Latent inhibition is previous learning. That affects, well, the law of effect. That affects the change in behavioral probability. In other words, it's a stimulus you didn't think about. In the experimenting, we called it a confound. That's a B. In the experimenting, we called it a confound. Okay, and a confound is something you didn't anticipate. And a good example of a confound is if we were to try to get you to eat bananas. Say, okay, bananas are good for you, they're high in potassium, so we're going to have you eat bananas. But what if you got really sick eating bananas? Or my son threw up this morning. What if he got sick eating lemons and we tried to give him lemon cough drops? Uh, he wouldn't like the taste of lemon. Um, because if he just ate, ate something lemony and then got sick, the type of lemon would already have a negative reinforcement. It would become a punishment to him. And if we try to use it as a reinforcement, his latent inhibition, his learning history would get in the way. Um, his previous learning changes the likelihood of using it. Um, using a, your ex's cologne, um, trying to convince your new significant other to wear your ex's cologne because you like that cologne, not a good idea. Um, and so when you try to tr figure out what someone's learning history is, you have to go back and look at their, at their past just to figure out what's going on. And it's even more, it's even more interesting because every single person, that's why I like looking at my photos, every single person has their own learning history, has their own backdrop, has their own background of things that they like um, and things that, that are important to them. And so when you try to do this, try to understand how the nature of things work, you have to really understand all the different stimuli in a particular person's environment. So there's a couple different ways that you can use this. Um, and this is something that's actually pretty, very useful in everybody's life. It's called shaping. Okay, with shaping, what you do is you have to identify target behavior. This is experimenting with behaviorism. Identify target behavior. Identify the measurement. Um, so I will, I will train the dog to do something interesting here um, in a little bit. So in, in order to change the dog's behavior, you have to define a measurement. So I'm going to try, she's never really done this, but she's ne I'm going to try the sit and stay behavior. Okay, so you can sit really well. Staying, however, is something that she's not necessarily good at. So I'm going to work on the stay behavior. 
So to define a stay, a stay is sit when I walk away. So when I walk away, we can measure this in meters and we can measure this in time. So I can measure distance for walking away and time for the stay aspect of it. So the, the distance and time is the measurement of success. What I'm going to use is her favorite food. Cheese sticks. Um, her favorite, her favorite food is the cheese stick, and the reason is because Grandpa always feeds her cheese sticks. So here's a stimulus that's a reinforcing for her, okay? Um, and it's, it's very good to use reinforcement. I'm not going to punish her because a punishment makes her afraid and it makes her pee on the rug. So I'm going to re reinforce her using cheese sticks. So when I sit and walk away, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have her sit. She will sit, no problem. And I'll walk away and then reinforce her for staying. Now. What I'm going to do first, to break this apart, is what the first step of the shaping is I'm going to have her sit and increase the time that she sits there. So I'm going to, in I'm going to start the stay. The reason I'm going to start stay first is because it's easier to teach her to sit and stay when I'm standing right there. Then I'm going to train her to, I'm going to walk back. And I'm going to walk back one meter first. I'm going to walk back a little bit first, just one big step back. Then I'm going to walk two meters back, and then three meters back. And I'm going to wait till she's successful at each one of these before I move to the next one. Then four meters back. Okay, and so I'm going to record this whole thing on the GoPro. I'll probably do it on um, speed uh, so that we can, uh, so you can see the whole thing. But it's, it's a whole process where you're doing things slowly, incrementally. And it's called shaping because you're just you're slowly introducing a behavior. You can introduce almost any behavior through shaping, um, and you just have to identify what you're going to do first, and then then you have to be able to identify um, how you're going to do it. So I'm going to go do this right now, and we'll find out how it works. Let me go back to the recorder and hit. Start out. Subject. Willing subject. Okay. Bridge. See if there's any stimulus involved. Oh. I'm gonna get a cheese stick out. Does she like cheese sticks? I think she likes cheese sticks. All right. Let's see what that looks like. That looks pretty good. All right, come here. You do a good sit, right? Okay. So I'm gonna open a cheese stick. Good sit. Nope. Stay. Gonna wait for a minute or so. She's a good job. Here we go. She's dead. Yeah. Yep. Sit. At one meter back. It's a good job. Here we go. Over here. Sit. Sit. Good job. Stay. Nope. Stay. Nope. Stay. Stay. Good job. Here's a good dog. Okay, it's a good job. 
Jenny. Good dog. Way back, way up over here. Nope. Good dog. Good sit. Good sit. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, one, two, three, four, foot. Come over here. Sit. Nope. Stay. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Oh, <laughs> ten is a good number. Stay. One. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Oh, <laughs> check good job. Okay, come over here. Okay, that works too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's a good dog. You got a good dog. Okay, come over here. Sitting on the floor, it's cold. Okay. Stop. Okay. Tap. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> it's a good job. Yeah. Yeah, good job.